Rambari. Good evening and a warm welcome to you to New Covenant Church, Bracknell, and to our studies in Paul's letter to the Romans, which is a Bible-based online Bible school project. It's often been said that what we call the Epistle to Romans could easily have been called the Gospel according to Paul. That's not to mean that Paul is focusing on those few events of the cross which are vital, but actually the truth that emerges from that, that flows from that, and touches all aspects of our life. So this is what we're doing so far. We're actually in our third series. This is our third winter that we've been doing these online Bible studies. And in the first series, we did an introduction. Then we looked at Paul's accusation of guilty that he brings against the whole human race. He brings it against the idolater. He brings it against the rationalist. He brings it against the Jew. And he says, there's no excuse you are without any kind of defense. There is no difference. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then in the second series, we looked at this thrilling topic of justification by faith. And we said that there was a delightful Papua New Guinea pidgin English translation of justification, which simply described it as God, him say, me okay. And we were saying that really it matters only what God says about my sin, only what God says about the accusations that are brought against me. And then we moved on into series two, where we looked not just at the implications of the individual transgressions against the known law of sin, not just things that could be measured, could be counted, but we began to go deeper as Paul goes deeper and began to look at the inward dynamic of sin. What is it that makes us the way that we are? And the way that God has so wonderfully dealt with that as well for those who have been baptized into Christ's death. And then we began this particular winter with this thorny question, potentially, what about Israel? So that's where we are at this point. What about Israel? And we're looking at Romans chapter chapters 9 to 11. And we commented on the fact that there's a popular UK television program called Location, Location, Location. And it's all about the buying and selling of properties and focuses often on the fact that the key element in all these things is the location. So we've hijacked the title and we've said that really whenever you come to passages of Scripture where you're wanting to dig deeper, to drill down into um, really important issues beneath, we have our own version of that, which is context, context, context. And particularly when you come to something like Romans chapters 9 to 11, which is what you could call dense, it's compact, where every sentence, every line, every word adds to the story and adds to the impact. And then you can't just scan that in the way that you might scan your evening newspaper. You really have to kind of find out what is the context. And we've been looking at some of the context to Paul's letter to the Romans, and particularly to these three chapters, Romans 9 through to 11. So we said that one of the first contexts that we have to bear in mind to make sure that we don't misinterpret what we're reading is where it flows from. And it actually flows from Romans chapter 8, where Paul begins to speak about providence and he begins to speak about predestination. I'm not going to go through all that again now, but those are vital things and they set the scene really for what Paul is going to say in Romans 9 to 11. In fact, really what he said about predestination, about God's ordering of things up until that point, now we'll find a practical explanation, a practical illustration in the story of Israel. Then we went on to 
another context that is important, and that is we were looking at the prophets, particularly prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and we were looking at the way in which God began to reveal to the people of Israel way back in roundabout sort of, uh, um, yes, 597, 587, when the southern kingdom of Judah was taken into captivity, we began to say about the way in which the prophets, as they began to speak to the nation, first of all warned them, told them what was going to happen, told them of the exile that they would suffer, but then began to speak of other things as well, something that was apparently beyond the end. Everything was going to come to an end, but actually there would be something that would continue beyond the end. And we looked particularly at places like Isaiah, and we saw that as Isaiah begins to predict that the people of Israel will return, and that they will be one nation again, and that they will be under one king again, you get this reference, particularly in Isaiah, to what you might call um, the remnant. And the remnant is not Israel as a whole, it's a group within Israel. It's a group of believers. This is why it's usually referred to as the believing remnant, that God would essentially start again. He would take seeds from the original, larger gathering of all Israel and bring those seeds back to the Promised Land and he would begin again. And actually, if you follow that through, you find that the ultimate plan and purpose of God and prediction of God is that his will will be fulfilled, not even in that returned believing remnant, but in one individual who in Isaiah is referred to as the servant of Jehovah. And this is our Lord Jesus. But the prophets begin to speak about the fact that God is going to restore things. And particularly when you get to Jeremiah, you get a reference to a new covenant. God is going to start all over again. He's going to do a new thing, Isaiah says. Ezekiel says he's going to give us a new heart and a new spirit. So there's going to be a brand new beginning. And when he begins, he starts off by saying he's going to make this covenant with the house of Israel, that's the northern kingdom of Israel, that had been taken into captivity uh, uh, in uh, well, about 722 BC. Samaria fell. And, um, and also that he's going, to, um, he's going to work with them and he's going to bring them back. Um, and that they're going to be this believing remnant, and that they will be God's people. They will be my people, says God. And it's a, a thing that we'll refer to later on this evening, that um, how can God promise to the people who are his people that he will make them his people? How can God's people become God's people? And we see that God makes these promises that he will return this believing remnant and that he will start all over again. And when we move on into the New Testament, we discover that Paul believes, and we believe because he speaks by revelation, Paul believes that he has seen God's secret, that all along God had a plan which is now being revealed. And the secret was this, that the restored reconstituted Israel would not just be a remnant from the house of Israel and a remnant from the house of Judah, but that it would include, this was a staggering concept, believing Gentiles. And they would all become one new nation under David, God's new people. Then we began, the last time we were together, to try to link Galatians to Romans. We've been really quite uh, diligent and restrained in keeping away from Galatians uh, as we've been studying Romans, but really Galatians is, has been referred to as the seed plot of Romans. Ideas that begin to germinate in Galatians, that begin to grow, actually come to their full size, come in fact to glorious blossom and fruit, 
in the letter to the Romans. And we made a start of that last time. So this is where we are up until this point. And what we're going to do tonight is do a little bit of a recap, but this is the territory that we're covering. We're going to look at the way in which in Galatians chapter 3, Paul makes reference to Abraham and Abraham's children. Then we're going to just remind ourselves something about the covenant of promise and why Paul is so insistent that this thing can only come as a consequence of promise and those who believe in the promise. And then we'll speak about sons, sons at last. And then an interesting concept that really only appears here. A second Jerusalem, another Jerusalem, not the earthly Jerusalem, but a heavenly Jerusalem. So that's what we're going to do. And we've already looked to a certain level at these two. But I will just say a word about the covenant of promise, because that will come into this passage we read in Galatians. And what this has to do with is this, that Paul, as he follows the story of Israel, doesn't follow what you might have expected would be the natural genealogy going down through the eldest son to the eldest son to the eldest son, but he strikes out on another genealogy, which really is, you could call, a genealogy of faith. And he shows that God's purposes have always been carried forward, not by genes, but by faith. They've been carried forward because people have believed what God is saying, and God has been able to move on to the next stage of what he is doing. And this becomes a key thing, that God's purposes could never be realized, by simply keeping the law, by us achieving a certain standard of righteousness, but that it would have to be accomplished by people putting their trust in God. In other words, believing the promises. And that's why he goes right back beyond Moses. He goes back to Abraham. And Abraham is referred in Romans and in Galatians as the father of us all. He is the archetype. He is the beginning of the Bible's story of this kind of, we might call it justifying faith. So uh, let's move on. We're going to look at sons at last. That's from Galatians chapter 3, verses 23, to chapter 4, verse 19. Let me read part of that. Before faith came, we were kept under God by the law. He's really, when he says we in this context, he's really referring to himself as part of the Jewish people. He says we were kept under law. The law has served us in a particular way. It's kept us safe. It's kept us sort of on the right track. It's kept us from going astray. So he says, before faith came, we were kept under God by the law. Kept, as to say, guarded for the faith which would afterward be revealed. So Paul says something that he's actually said uh, earlier on here too, uh, in uh, chapter 2. that The law was only ever intended to be temporary. It was added, says Paul, because of transgressions, until the seed should come to whom the promise was made. So the law could never find its consummation in people who were actually just keeping the letter of the law. So I'll read verse 23. But before faith came, we were kept under God by the law, kept for the faith which would afterward be revealed. Therefore the law was our, and the New King James Version uses the word tutor here. I don't think that's the best translation. This is a Greek word, paedagogos. And the paedagogos was not actually a tutor. He wasn't a teacher, as the old King James said. He was actually what I sometimes refer to as the little boy's worst nightmare. He was your own personal policeman. Uh, he was usually a slain, a slave who was used by uh, 
uh, the parents to make sure that the child got to the tutor, that he didn't go astray, he didn't go scrumping apples or find something much more interesting to do, but was taken there. We'll say more about that uh, in a moment. Verse 24, Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, so we are moving into something now where Paul refers to faith coming. There is the arrival of faith. And when people come to the place of faith, or when faith comes to them, however you want to express that, something changes. And this is what he has to say. In verse 25 he says, After faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor, under a paedagogus, under the child conductor. So that's goodbye to the child conductor. After faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. If you remember that Paul has identified this child conductor as being the law, this is a startling thing because he says, we are eff effectively, he is saying, we are no longer under the law. Our life is now ruled by faith. And remember, faith is based upon the promises of God. It's based upon God speaking. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So God speaks into our lives, and we obey God, and that is faith. And then he says this, After faith has come, we, we Jews, are no longer under a tutor. Let me say a little bit about the background to this. It seems that through the churches of Galatia, these different churches where Paul had been evangelizing, many had come to Christ. They'd come to their own personal encounter with faith, and they had known justification by faith. Uh, Paul explains it like this. He says, uh, having begun in the Spirit. So they'd had an encounter with God in which they had begun in the Spirit. But it seems that when Paul continued on his journey and finally got back to Antioch in Syria, uh, that people followed him and began to undermine his teaching. They began to say to the new converts that it was all well and good to come to Christ by faith, to put your trust in him. But after you've come to him, your progress, your development, your growth in grace could only be achieved by keeping the law. So you can start by faith, but the only way you can come to perfection will be by keeping the law. And Paul protests against that in uh, Galatians chapter 2. He says, having begun in the spirit, are you made perfect in the flesh? As to say, made perfect by human effort in keeping the law of God. And then he says this in verse 26, having said that uh, faith has come and we are no longer a tutor. He switches. Listen to the switch in the pronoun. Verse 24, Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. For you, did you notice the switch? He switched from we to you. He's now focusing again upon the Gentile believers in Galatia. So he says, you are all sons. That's one of the sad translations of the wonderful old King James Version, that there you have the word child, and it isn't the word child, it's the word son. One of the uh, problems with the old King James Version is that there are two words that are translated in a sort of a random way almost. One is technos, which actually means child. The other is huios, which actually means son. But sometimes... The Old King James translates technos as child and sometimes as son. And sometimes the Old King James Version translates the word huyas, which means son, sometimes as son, and sometimes as child. In other words, it does not distinguish between these two words. And this is one place in particular where it was vital to make the distinction. Listen, you are all sons. You are sons. You do not have to go through a process uh, 
of childhood and growing maturity into sons. He'll explain that as he goes on here. He says, You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ, this is this same almost unique phrase that Paul uses in Romans chapter 6, where he speaks about being baptized into Christ. Not baptized into the name of, he's not thinking about water baptism, he's thinking about union with the person of Christ. So he says, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And then he makes this uh, amazing statement. Uh, he says, um, that is neither Jew nor Greek. We'll see how that works out in a moment. So there's our child conductor who, there are images of the child conductor actually taking the little boy by his ear and carrying a small whip to make sure he gets to his proper destination. And his proper destination is Christ. The law is not the destination. The law is the journey. It's the route that God gave to close people in, to keep them from going astray, so that they would come to the proper tutor, who is Christ himself. So there's the, the pedagogos. And here's our verse in verse 26 onwards. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So here's a question that we can ask. If, if I have come to genuine faith in Christ, if I have been baptized into him and become united with him, According to what Paul is saying in verse 29, I am Abraham's seed. And that's a challenging thought, isn't it? I have a friend who uh, was talking to a Jewish rabbi on one occasion and had this verse in mind and actually said to him, um, I'm of the seed of Abraham too. And the rabbi protested and would not receive this word from this renegade rabbi called Paul. But if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So by regeneration, you become a son. And we have said, and we'll say a little bit more about this again next time we're together, we have said that when the Bible thinks about sons, often when it thinks about the placing of sons, or as it is in many of our Bibles, the word adoption, it's not thinking about babies being taken into the protective care of a family. It's actually thinking of an adult who is being made part of the family in order that he can carry on the family business or the family political line or whatever it is. And the most famous adoptee would be um, Octavius Caesar, who became known as Augustus Caesar. And he was, I think he was a nephew, actually, of Julius Caesar, but Julius Caesar adopted in him in his will, so that the moment that Julius Caesar died, Octavius became Julius Caesar's adopted son, and consequently the heir. That's the key thing about adopted sons. They become heirs, heirs of your calling, heirs of um, your provision, heirs. That's what they are. Then Paul goes on into Romans chapter 4. And he says, now, I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all. What he's going to do now is he's going to show that actually the Gentile who comes by faith, 
and is baptized into Christ, becomes a son, and the Jewish people who were, in a sense, not sons, but were in the role of child, they too now have become sons. And he explains it like this. Chapter 4, verse 1. The heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave. Let me tell you another little story. This is a one of our family stories, and there's one member of this family who didn't like this story too much. I had an uncle. Uh, he was um, a married man, but he he had no children. And when he died, he left um, a small amount of money, actually, I think it was a hundred pounds, for each one of his brother's sons, uh, children, and grandchildren. At that time, we had three children. So our children had, I think it was a hundred pounds, I'm not quite sure now. Three of them had a hundred pounds. By the time the lawyers had done all their work, we actually had four sons, four children. But in fact, um, the fourth child didn't count. And the reason he didn't count is that he had not been born at the time that the will was executed. So we had four children, actually two girls and two boys to begin with. Uh, we had um, three of them growing up with their eye on their inheritance. And they knew that I had been made the executor and I had to invest this very simply in a building society. Um, and it was slowly accumulating money and that when they were 21, their day would come and they would receive their inheritance. And a fourth child who had no inheritance. But actually, during all the years of their growing, there was no difference between the heir and the slave. There was no difference between the three who had a prospect and the one who had no prospect. They weren't any richer. They weren't um, discriminated in favor of in any way at all. It was just an oddity of this particular will and the way that it worked out. And the time duly came when each one became 21. They received their inheritance. And the fourth child, when he became 21, no inheritance. This is what Paul says. Galatians chapter 4, verse 1. Now I say that the heir as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Now, three of my children had a time appointed by my uncle Fred, and they could look forward to it, and they had promises on their lives, but actually, day by day, their lives were no better off than the son who had no promise upon his life. That, that child is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. And then Paul again switching back to this plural pronoun of we. He says, even so we, we Jews, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of of the world. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive sonship. That's the promise that we might receive sonship. So this is what Paul is saying. But the point he's making is that Gentile believers actually didn't have this period of probation. They didn't have this time when they were under the law. Only the Jews were under the law. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a paedagogos. We are no longer under that restraint. He is no longer our guide. We're no longer under guardians and stewards. We are fully grown, fully recognized sons, that we might receive the adoption as sons. So 
he says they're no longer children. And we Gentiles are no longer bond servants. That's the truth of it. Because you are sons, he says, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer bond servants, but a son. And here it comes through again. And if a son, then an heir. So if the father has fixed the date that the child becomes an adult, he receives the son placing, he receives adoption, from that moment on he is fully an heir in exactly the same way as the others were heir. They've all come into an inheritance. This is the wonderful thing that we Gentiles, I say we, because I was speaking to people who were mostly, well, exclusively Gentiles, that we had no promises on our lives. We had nothing to look forward to. Uh, but the amazing thing is that we have entered into a promise that was not ours, and God now regards us as sons. Verse 7, Therefore you are no longer a slave but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. But then indeed when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods, but now, having known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements in which you desire again to be bondage and be in bondage? That's Paul saying to these Gentiles in Galatia that in putting themselves under the law, they're putting themselves under the obligations that actually have no outcome because they've already inherited their inheritance. They've already become sons in this pattern of things. And that then he says to them, um, you observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid for you, uh, lest I have labored for you in vain. And then he says this. He, I've said here that he changes his mood. I'm afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. Brethren, I urge you to become like me, for I became like you. You have not injured me at all. You know that because of physical infirmity I preached the gospel to you at the first, and my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. What then? was the blessing you enjoyed. For I bear you witness that if possible you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Have I therefore become your enemy, because I tell you the truth? They zealously court you, but for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you, that you may be zealous for them. And, and then he says when he comes on, he says, But it's good to be zealous in a good thing always, and not only when I am present with you, my little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ be formed in you. I would like to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I have doubts about you. So in the first half up to this point, the uh, Galatian believers have been in trouble. They have come under stinging rebukes, really, from Paul. But now Paul gets to this point and he says, I want to change my tone. I want to change the mood. And that's what he does here. Um, so we can move on a little bit. It was... Okay, I'm just trying to see where we are. Okay. So, the Jews are sons at last, and we are sons at last. And then Paul comes on to this next one, and he begins to speak about Jerusalem being a mother. And now we're moving to Galatians chapter 4, verses 21 to 23. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it's written that Abraham had two sons, 
So he's going back to the story of Abraham. And now he's not going back to primarily to the story of Abraham's justifying faith. But he's going back to another part of the story of Abraham. And he says here that Abraham had two sons. The one by the bondwoman and the other one by the free. So he's going to open out an allegory in which there will be two wives and two covenants. Paul was um, uh, high, greatly favoured too, if you remember, when we were in Romans, we discovered that he was making a contrast between uh, two men, Adam and Christ, two masters, uh, two husbands, uh, two laws or principles of law, and now in Galatians, or earlier in Galatians here, he is this allegory of two wives. The first wife, of course, essentially was Sarah. But Sarah gave birth to no children. And so they hit on this ruse that Hagar, Sarah's serving maid, would sleep with Abraham, and this was quite permissible in those days, and she would bear a son who would become, in a sense, she would, this is a little bit kind of like a proxy birth, and her son would now become Abraham and Sarah's son, but of course the essential link would be missing in that she wasn't actually Sarah's son. Hagar gave birth to a son, and for the son there was no promise. He was born according to the flesh. He wasn't born because Abraham was putting his faith in a promise of God, but because Abraham was actually adopting a methodology whereby God's will would be accomplished through human assistance. That's always deadly. When God has promised something and we then set ourselves to achieve that thing by human ingenuity or craft, it's always going to lead to some kind of disaster. So Hagar has no promise. Her son has no promise. He's born according to the flesh. Hagar, it goes on here to say, really represents Sinai. Let me read this. Verse 23. He who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman, later, Sarah did bear a son, through promise which things are symbolic or an allegory. For these are the two covenants. There are many covenants in the Bible, but Paul in Galatians actually identifies two covenants. And these two covenants actually are what I would call the Sinai covenant and the Calvary covenant. The one covenant that came into existence at Mount Sinai when the descendants and their fellow travelers of the sons of Israel actually became God's people. That's the Sinai covenant. And Paul here writing says, these are two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai. And he says, in this picture I'm using, in this allegory, Hagar represents Mount Sinai. The earthly Jerusalem and bondage. This is really, again, an extraordinary illustration that Paul uses, in that you know that the Jews would sometimes say, if I forget Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. And at Passover, they would often say, or at least they certainly said it in the centuries that followed this, next time, next year, in Jerusalem. So Jerusalem was the focus of much of their attention. But here Paul says, Hagar, the slave woman, represents the earthly Jerusalem and bondage, and that all comes from Sinai. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage, with her children. But then he begins to speak of the other 
Sarah. And he says this in verse 26. But the Jerusalem above is free, who is the mother of us all. So he uses Hagar as a picture of Sinai and the earthly Jerusalem, which always results in bondage. And he contrasts that with, Mer with Sarah and the covenant that depends upon promise and the Jerusalem which is above, who is free and the mother of us all. Why does he say the mother of us all? Because if we're born again, born again from above, as Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, we have a new mother. And the Jew needs a new mother too. The Gentile needs a new mother, and the Jew needs a new mother. We need to be born from above, from Jerusalem, who is the mother of us all. So these are really quite amazing things he says here. In Isaiah 54, we'll look at this because it's, um, it's a key thing. Let me just remind you, first of all, that Isaiah 54 actually follows Isaiah 53. And you probably know Isaiah 53 because that's the chapter of Isaiah that really speaks about the cross. That's the one where we see Christ upon the cross. We see him bearing our sins. Uh, we see him achieving God's purposes so that the pleasure of God will prosper in his hand and he will see of the travail of his soul and be satisfied. That's Isaiah 53. And then you get into Isaiah 54 and it says this, For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Do you remember that Sarah had no children and Hagar had a child? But Sarah has the promise that she will actually become the mother of many children. So we've got this contrast, this allegory, still running here. But the astonishing thing is, is that this Isaiah 54 is a passage that many people think of in terms of a renewed Israel and a future Israel and great promise for Israel. But when Paul uses it here, he applies it to the Jerusalem which is above, who is the mother of us all, and it follows immediately on the heels of Isaiah 53. So this, this Jerusalem cannot bear children until Isaiah 53 has been accomplished. In other words, not until the cross has done its work. Only after the cross can, how shall we express this, the womb of the heavenly Jerusalem be opened so that she can bear children. So this promise in Isaiah 54, Paul has no hesitation in saying, this has to do with the Jerusalem which is above. Now, these promises seem to apply so strongly to Israel. So what are we talking about here? We're really talking about what I prefer to call the reconstituted people of God. God spoke in the prophets and said that his people would no longer enjoy his mercy, particularly the northern tribe of, uh, of uh, Israel. But then another time would come when they would know his mercy and he says no mercy no people the people will come to an end because my mercy towards you as a people will end and then he says and in the same place you will be called my people because I will have mercy upon you so this is getting a little bit confusing now you say well what's happening here well the old Israel the old definition if you like of Israel actually is coming to an end and God is going to start again. He's going to give mercy, and he's going to start again with a new, newly reconstituted people of Israel, a new people of God. A new Israel who would be the believing remnant of old Israel and Judah, 
plus believers from among the Gentiles. This was Paul's secrets. And this is why it goes on in verse 28 of this to say, uh, Nor uh, Now we children, as Isaac was, are children of promise. So he's saying our birth comes in the same line of those who are the consequence of faith, not the consequence of law-keeping, not the consequence of do-it-yourself achieved righteousness, but who are the receivers of an imputed righteousness through God's great mercy. So this is a new Israel who include a believing remnant of old Israel and old Judah and members of the Gentile who are believers. And he says, we are the children of promise. And then he says a really startling thing in verse 29. He says this, are you ready for this? Because this is very strong meat, he says here. But as he who was born according to the flesh, then persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what does the Scripture say? And then he goes back to um, this reference to Sarah. And he says this. This is Galatians chapter 4, verse 30. Nevertheless, what does the Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. That is Paul strongly declaring that you do not become children of God simply because you are those who received a, a promise, um, those who received a covenant. This is not automatically guaranteed because you're part of the Sinai people of God. What he says here is this, Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman. There can be no mutual coexistence. You cannot have a mixed multitude. You cannot have in the new people of God some who are there because they are physical descendants of Abraham and some who are there because faith has come. There's no mutual coexistence. And he goes on to say, Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Okay, so this is where we've been this evening. We've been reminding ourselves of the context, and the context tonight, not context one or context two, but we've been reminding ourselves of the third context, this link between Galatians and Romans. Remember, Galatians was written before Romans, and we need to carry with us into Romans the truths that Paul has established in Galatians. We don't start from cold in Romans. We start, Paul has a history. Paul's teaching has a history. Actually, people will know about it. That's why Paul is explaining things so meticulously in Romans, because Paul's teaching has a history, and it has been misconstrued and actually mis, uh, mistaught. Um, so that's what it's all about. So we'll leave it there, and um, we'll just close with a word of prayer, and then we'll pick up this theme again the next time we're together. Okay, let's pray together. Our Father, these are, these are strong things to say. We begin to see, Lord, an absolute break between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Not a merging, not an addition, not one thing attached to an older thing, but an old thing that comes to its absolute end, that no longer has any effective power, no longer has any force in law under its old patterns. 
but we see a new concept in which there is neither Jew nor Gentile, male nor free, uh, male nor female, bond or free, but are all one in Christ Jesus. And I, I do pray, Lord, for any who hear this tonight, that you will help them and us, Lord, to consider these things and to allow the truth of God perhaps to unsettle some of our previously held concepts and to think this through under your guidance again and to ask what are the implications here. If it is true that not all Israel are of Israel, if it's true that there are people who can be Israel who had no genetic line through to Abraham, if it's true that only those who are the faith are the true sons of Abraham, what are our implications, Lord, that we carry forward now into the rest of Romans? We pray, Lord, that you'll help us and enable us to walk in the full power and force of a new covenant with no mixture of covenants, no bits of this and bits of that, but a covenant in which you have taken away the old in order that you may establish the new. And we pray, Lord, that we may glorify your Son, who is in himself the personification of the new covenant. Amen.